that was it. We just exploded. Um, from almost zero to one billion in under five years. In your book, you, you make two confessions. And one of them is... Joe Foster is the co-founder of Reebok, one of the largest and most recognizable sportswear brands in the world. With early roots in shoemaking, his grandfather was a pioneer not only in the shoe market, but also in marketing through the use of influencers. He knew what influencing was, because he gave his shoes to the right people, the people who would win races. He supplied all the Olympic teams with, with footwear, at the 1920 Antwerp Olympics. 1904, he had three world records in, in his shoes. Under Joe's leadership, the family's local shoemaking business was turned into a billion dollar brand. One year, one year into aerobics, we were a $30 million company. A year later, we were a $90 million company. And a year after that, a $300 million company. A year after that, just over a year, we were a $900 million company. <laughs> Joe pushed the envelope and had many pioneering ideas, such as making the first ever sneaker designed and marketed towards women, which made Reebok the number one sports shoe brand in the US and the entire world. Half the class were wearing the same sneaker, the other half the class, no shoes. Why don't we make a shoe specifically for aerobics? We break down the secrets of not only building a multi-billion dollar brand, but also the thoughts around stepping down from one's life work. It's still in the very early days of sequel stories. And before this episode, I want to say thank you for being part of this community. And I feel so honored to sit with so many great people to ask the questions that I'm literally genuinely interested in. And uh, we're a small but growing team thanks to you who is watching and engaging with the videos. So this is the very beginning of a big vision and we have very big plans which can become real by growing the show further. So if you enjoy the conversations, there is just one thing we're asking, which is to please hit the subscribe button. That is the most impactful thing for us to host more great guests and it would mean the world to us. All right, back to the episode. So today I have the chance to chat with a living legend uh, all the way from England, 87 years old. This man has built one of the biggest brands in the world, uh, not only the biggest in a moment, but over many decades. Um, he's also an author and I've read the book. It's called Shoemaker. And I think it gives a really interesting insight into how challenging it can be to build a big and global brand. The guest today is Joe Foster, founder of Rebook. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to have a chat. Yes. It, it's an honor. Where are, you, where are you today? Where are you calling in from? Well, today we're back in England because we, um, Julie and I, we do travel an awful lot these days. Uh, and you mentioned it, Shoemaker. Shoemaker has created a bit of interest and people like to uh, invite us to different places. So we've just come back from India about a week ago. And uh, into, in, on Wednesday, we do leave for Australia. So we're another month wow. traveling and, uh, and doing interviews in Australia. So, uh, but today... We're, we're back in the United Kingdom and we're preparing. We have to get back here just to change the, war, the wardrobe around. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's long, long travel, like long flights from India and then back to Australia. It's almost going back the same way. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But um, at my age, you didn't mention 87. We, we decided to take it a little easier. And we're, we're going to, from, uh, from Manchester, we go to Dubai. And we're having two days in Dubai. And then from Dubai, we're going down to Singapore. And we're having two days in Singapore. <clears throat> then it's Singapore to Adelaide. So we're, we're taking our time, six days to get there. And it'll be on the, the same on the, coming back. However, we, we are going to stop in Dubai for a week and have a week relaxing in Dubai uh, on the way back. And um, I want to start off with asking, um, how, are you? how are you? How is life treating you? <laughs> Life, life is life is pretty good, and um, I did pick up a cold in India, which meant we cut up, cut that journey short a bit. But uh, I'm I'm over that now. Just a bit of a cough left, those things. But um, beyond that, we're we're good. We're good. We we enjoy the travel, and we enjoy the places that we go to. 
So you were born in Bolton in the UK in 1935, and you grew up partly during the Second World War. And uh, unfortunately, we yes. also have war in Europe to this day in 2023. But was the war present for you as a kid, as a child, when you were growing up? Um, no, not really. When, when you're young, you've no, no, no expectations. There's, you don't know any different. In fact, it's quite exciting when all the lights, street lights are out and you're able to run around just by moonlight or whatever. It, so you, you, you derive a lot of pleasures from the, from the difference. And it's, uh, okay, we were uh, 10 miles sort of slightly uh, north of Manchester and Manchester did get air raids. So we could, and we were slightly elevated. So from, from our, uh, our home, we could actually see, we couldn't see bombs landed, but you could certainly see the glow in the sky uh, from, from buildings burning. And so, uh, as I say, I, I don't think we had any fear or any, any thought that this was bad or good. We were, we were young. I mean, I was only from born in 35, the war started in 39. I was only four years old, maybe towards the end of the, end of the war when I was 10. But by that time, of course, we were winning the war. So it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't something I wasn't learning anything terrible was going to happen. So the war was an experience in many ways. The early sirens, they were you know, when we had a, an air raid coming on. And uh, those, those are memorable. So you remember those moments. But, uh, and you also remember the fact that uh, you couldn't really travel. Like mm. covid you couldn't mm. travel anywhere because, uh, you know, you couldn't... Well, first thing, there was very little petrol around. And we were fortunate, fortunate enough to have a car, but obtaining petrol was a bit difficult. But um, I, I suppose, really, uh, my brother and myself, we, as much as you could, enjoyed those war years. I read your book, uh, Shoemaker, The Untold Story, and uh, I think what's very... What's very interesting and different from other companies here is that the story actually begins with your grandfather in the late 1800s, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, so can you take me back and you know, share that story in the beginning and, and some of the, the lessons learned and, and early memories you have from your grandfather? My grandfather died in 1933, mm -hmm. and I wasn't born until 1935. But um, <clears throat> that's about 15 months after he died. But I, I was born on his birthday, which again was a coincidence. Mm. But uh, and my grandmother insisted I I took his name, which was Joseph. So Joe, Joe was my granddad's name, became my name. But of course, the uh, the history of Foster's did go back to 1895, when my grandfather, as a youngster, 15 years old. He, he made for himself a pair of running shoes with spikes in the bottom. Probably one of the first to do that, it, if he ever invented it. It's hard, to, it's hard to go back that far and know who invented what. But uh, he made, he made uh, a pair of spike running shoes. To the envy, to the envy of his club mates, because he was a member of a, an athletics club. And uh, they did improve his, his, his running. He, he was usually sort of halfway down the field when it came to a race. Uh, but with his new, uh, his new powerful weapon, his spike running shoes, he, he became a very unlikely second, and that caused a lot of attention. And this also created his business. <laughs> so that was because of his own creativity and inventiveness that he he thought out to to put these spikes on on the shoes that he was wearing. Yeah, well, I mean, we we know very well that he. Uh, his father was a confectioner, but he didn't want to be a confectioner. He wanted to be a cobbler, like his, gra his, his grandfather. So he would go and visit his grandfather in Nottingham, which was about 50 miles away from where he lived. And his grandfather not only repaired street shoes, he also repaired cricket boots. And cricket had been going in the UK for a long time. And cricket boots had spikes in the bottom. And we're pretty sure he would ask his grandfather, hmm, why have they got spikes in the bottom of these boots? And his grandfather probably answered, because it gives them grip. And that must have been a nice light bulb moment for grandfather. And thought, oh, well, when I'm running, if I put some spikes in the bottom of my shoes, I will get grip. <clears throat> so we think that's where he got his idea from. And uh, 
And it was very successful because he, he had a very, very successful business. Uh, by uh, 1904, he had three world records in, in his shoes uh, at one event at Ibrox Park, which is Glasgow. So he had three world records, and by 1908, he had Olympic medals. So, yeah, it was a pretty good idea, a pretty good invention, and he, uh, he knew what influencing was because he gave his shoes to the right people, the people who would win races, and that would influence other people to, to buy his product. So grandfather knew something that uh, is very well used today, influencing people. Influencers are, uh, influencers are very well paid today. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in those days, he just needed to give a pair of shoes, and that's how the influence started. And I think that's so interesting because it, it, it's kind of... I think the earliest example that I've heard, maybe he was even, you know, the first to do it, but to to give his shoes. And I don't know if sometimes he, he paid people as well, but kind of the Michael Jordans of that time to to use his shoes and to to really <laughs> to really show what what they were all about. So can you tell me about like how that began and, and what kind of people were using uh, his shoes? I think we, you've got to start with the system that. Uh operated then with athletics because athletics as we know we look at the olympics today and we see every sport possible is now part of the olympics um in my grandfather's day it was just track and field track and field and in field events one thing that we don't see today is tug of war tug of war was big in those days and that four or five burly men on either side of a rope and they would tug. That was all part of uh, field events. But um, in, in, in the UK, we had the three A's, that's the Amateur Athletic Association, <clears throat> and clubs in, in various towns all became members of that association. So there was a lot of information as to where the next uh, local event would be held, and so all round about the county, he would go to each of these events. And really, yes, soccer, I don't know whether you call it football or soccer. These days, Foot. we tend to call it more like soccer because we talk to America a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't understand football as soccer. It's soccer. Over here, it's football so, as well. <laughs> it's football as well. Yeah. Well, football was really growing in, uh, in the United Kingdom at that time. And... Uh, so, so apart from track and field, I think track and field was very popular. Uh, more popular possibly, possibly than football at the time, but football was growing and becoming quite, uh, quite interesting because we do have, and we've got to go to the 1920s, and by the 1920s, my grandfather was supplying every Premier League, there wasn't a Premier League then, <laughs> but every club that we know now in the Premier League and the first and the second divisions, all the UK clubs, my grandfather was supplying them, uh, not only with boots, but also training shoes. And we have a letterhead, which is we've replicated from the 1920s, which has all the names of all the clubs that he was supplying. So, uh, and he was supplying them direct. They didn't buy them from anywhere else. They bought them from my grandfather. So, uh, and he, he was fairly original in his day because he was a pure uh, athletics footwear manufacturer. Whereas a lot of people making football boots in those days, they actually made army boots. They made all sorts of boots. And what they did, they just made it a little bit different, put some studs in the bottom and called that a football boot. Very heavy, very chunky and uh, difficult to wear. So grandfather's, his boots were more like today's boots, made out of lightweight leather and uh, a lot more flexible. So, uh, but he, he was only a small company. But then again, I, I guess if we look, even then, if we look back at football, you, you know, you, you don't get the volumes you get today. I mean, so many people played it oh. and, uh, and football has grown so much. So <clears throat> although he would supply all these good teams, uh, there were not that many football teams uh, to supply. And probably also grandfather's boots were rather expensive because the, uh, the cheaper, heavier uh, boots that were being made by uh, boot makers, football boots, they, they were cheaper. 
So he just he just concentrated on the top end. Uh, but uh, certainly, well, his biggest problem, of course, was the second decade of the 20th century when we had World War One, and World War One, who needed running shoes. Hmm. So uh, during that period, they actually started to repair army boots. So they would have boots being brought back from Flanders or whatever, and they, that's how they stayed alive as a company. They repaired football boots, uh, sorry, army boots. And, and it wasn't until the 20s, but I think the 1920s, that was my grandfather's, that was his belly pock, that was, that was his time. Um, and on this letterhead that uh, we have, which has all the football teams on, there's also at the bottom corner that uh, he supplied all the Olympic teams, and I'm not sure what he means by all the Olympic teams, with, with footwear at the 1920 Antwerp Olympics. So he supplied them all. I, I would, and I do know that he supplied some of the American team, So whether he, and he probably supplied all the British team. But again, we've got to remember, we're talking track and field. We're not talking mm. all these myriad of sports which now make the Olympics. Yeah. Um, also, if you've heard of the film Chariots of Fire, mm. well, Chariots of Fire, there were three athletes, Eric Little, um, Harold Abraham and Lord Burley. Uh, Little and Abraham, I think it's in 24 in Paris, they both won gold medals. I think it was in 28, but I can't remember where the Olympics were in 28. But all those three were immortalised in that film, Chariots of Fire. And they all won their gold medals wearing my grandfather's shoes. So he had a big reputation, really big. And unfortunately... As I say, by 1930, he died in 1933, aged 53, which was very sad, and he was very young. So take me to the birth of Rebook and your family at the time with your brother and your father. Can you tell me about the origins of how, how that came about after your um, um, yeah, after your grandfather died and then eventually as you grew up? Well, obviously, I, was, I wasn't even born when grandfather died, yeah. so uh, I, I didn't know him. But, of course, um, the uh, J.W. Foster and Sons, which is his, his company, that continued. And uh, during the war years of, uh, of the Second World War, of course, again, repairing, uh, repairing not, not only army, army boots, they also made sandals and different different footwear that uh, because nobody wanted sports footwear during those years. But so after the war, and uh, we're talking 45, I'm 10 years old. My brother Jeff, he was two years older than me. And at 14, he joined the company. I didn't join the company until I was 17. I'd been to college, done a little bit more. And then we're still just after World War Two, mm. And... Uh, we had national service. National service meant any, well, fairly fit young man had to go and do two years in the, in the army or in the armed forces. And so at 18, I went away to do my national service in the RAF. And Jeff, although he was older than me, he'd been deferred. And we both went at the same time. So we're both away from the factory and we're both doing our national service. Jeff went to Germany. And he was in Germany and he saw... Adidas and he saw Puma, different. They were making things different than Foster's. Foster was still making that same shoe that Granddad would, had made in the 1920s. So they hadn't moved on. Uh, and by that time, my father and uncle, they were running the company. And that seemed okay. But when, when we came back from doing national service, you know, it, it takes you away from the normal things of home life. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you go to do something like going to college, all of a sudden you've got to look after yourself. You start to think a little bit differently. So when we came back after having this experience, we came back to a failing company, J.W. Foster's, failing. The, you, we could see it. And, okay, so I'm talking to my father and say, come on, we, we have to change. We Look at Adidas, look at Puma, look at what they're doing. And at that point... Adidas has started to take over football. They'd come in and they'd taken the football business. Foster's no longer had any football business. Um, you know, we've got to change. But the biggest problem, my father and uncle just did not get on together. 
who was five years different in age, and like uh, like Adi Dassler and Rudy Dassler, they both fought. They couldn't get on with each other. Well, neither could the Foster brothers. My father and uncle just could not get on with each other. Hardly spoke. In fact, we could find that they would fight each other more more than they would speak to each other. Well, Rudy Dassler had the good sense to leave the company and set up Puma. Unfortunately, my father and uncle, they just kept feuding and kept feuding. And uh, although my brother and myself, we tried hard to sort of say, you've got to change, you've got to do diff- something different. Father wouldn't, wouldn't listen. All my father would say to me is, look, Joe, when I'm gone and your uncle's gone, this company will be yours. And I said, well, look, Dad, number one, we don't want you to go. That's not the plan. But this, this company will be gone long before you've gone. It's dying now. Didn't make any difference, didn't really have any effect. As far as he was concerned, it was earning a living, and uh, that's all he really needed. So he didn't listen to us. But uh, Jeff and myself, we, we thought, well, there's only one way out of this. We are going to have to leave. We're going to have to set up our own company. So we did. In 1958, we'd made some arrangements. We'd, we'd been to, in fact, we went to college at night. We went to Evening College, and, and that was a shoe college, about 15 miles away from Bolton. And uh, apart from learning something about how to make shoes differently than what we, we actually learned on the factory floor, we made a lot of friends. We met a lot of people who knew a lot of things, where to get materials from. You know, machinery, all oh, so so we were in a good position when we wanted machinery. We just asked some friends, and we just managed to get all our machinery together. We uh, we rented a building, a dilapidated building. It was a terrible building, but <clears throat> it was good enough for us. We were young, you know. When you're young, well, what can go wrong, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that was it. We left and we set up our company called Mercury Sports Footwear. How did you? Um feel and bring up the conversation with your father when you were saying that you were not joining the company yourself but you were going to do something different we wanted him to come with us we wanted him to sort of come on let's start a business a separate business but he wouldn't do that um so he, he must have had some idea that we were we were, we would were, we would be restless so it was just on on one friday at the end of the week and i just went to say to my father that uh, look You know, Jeff and I have decided we're leaving, so, uh, you know, this will be our last day. And uh, he didn't he didn't seem as though he was listening to me. And I'm saying, Dad, we're, we're leaving. Jeff and I are leaving. He turned around and he said, uh, why? Dad, we've had the story. We've had the argument so many times. We're leaving because you won't. You won't change this company. This company's dying. And all he did is he, he picked up a letter opener. A letter opener was a bit like a knife, and he stood up and went towards me. And I just wondered, what was he going to do? And he turned it around and handed me the letter opener and said, right, stab me now. Um, I was lost for words at that point, and so I said, Dad, we're leaving. And I put the letter opener down, and that was it. We just left the company. Oh my god. And and after this how uh, did you did you still keep in touch with your father or was that kind of like a moment where you grew apart? Well, surprisingly enough, uh, I was the one that used to do all the talking. I was the one that used to try and get things moving. And Jeff, whilst he agreed with me, he didn't voice it. He just agreed with me and and at that time uh, Jeff was still living with my father and mother. They were still living at home. I had left. I was married and I had I'd left the uh, the family house. But he was still living there, so I got the blame. <laughs> uh, Jeff, Jeff sort of, you know, and he, he used to say to me, you know, I, I was the one who had led him astray, had taken Jeff away from the, from the, from the business. It was all my fault. Um, that probably lasted for <coughs> maybe about three years for me. It lasted about three years. I think Jeff got away with it. He was okay, but uh, 
I think it took about three years for my father to get over it. Mother was okay. Mother understood very well what we had done and why we had done it. But I think it took, it took my father about three years. Then he eventually came around. I think I read somewhere or heard somewhere that you used the, some of these spike shoes that your grandfather invented and ran a race that you won, and in it you won a U.S. dictionary. And it was in this dictionary that you eventually found the word Reebok. Is that true? That is true, yes. The story, of course, is that uh, we started life, Jack and myself started life as uh, Mercury Sports Footwear. And we were doing nicely. And our encounter to said, Joe, you're doing okay. You better register Reebok, better register Mercury. And, uh, you know, we're only young, we're naive, we... We went, well, why do we need to do that? Well, he said, uh, if somebody else thinks that uh, the, the word Mercury is pretty good and they like uh, to make some sports shoes, uh, you're going to have trouble if somebody else starts using that name because you've got to prove that, no, no, we're using it, it's our name. So you go and register it. So he gave me the name of uh, a patent agent in Manchester and I contacted him. And said, look, we've got to register our name. He knew all about that, of course. We've got to register uh, Mercury. He came back um, about a week later because he checked everything. And he said, I'm sorry, Joe. He said, but uh, it's already pre-registered in, uh, uh, in Class 25, which is shoes, registered by British Shoe Corporation. British Shoe Corporation are a massive corporation. <laughs> They're big, you know. We're just three people, Jeff, myself, and somebody stitching the leather together. Oh, right. And, uh, but he said they're not using it. Oh, okay. Um, and he said they, they, they've offered it to us for a thousand pounds. Wow. A thousand pounds is like somebody asking for a million today. I mean, it was <laughs> yeah, incredible. Was we say. just set up our factory for 250 pounds. 250 pounds, <laughs> we've got everything. We've got a factory. Look. A thousand pounds. No, we can't pay a thousand pounds. Well, he said, "Look, they're not using it, so you can take them to court, and uh, and claim because of non-usage that you can use the name." Oh, I said, "Great, yeah, okay. How much is that going to cost me?" He said, "A thousand pounds." We haven't got a thousand pounds. We can't do that. So he said, "Okay, then you uh, you'll have to find a new name." Oh, right, find a new name. He said, "But don't bring me one." Bring me ten. And he he pointed through his window in Manchester and he did got it was a nice day. And the window was open and he pointed to Kodak. And I was saying, what, what's with Kodak? He said, Well, that's their name. They made it up. So nobody can nobody can stop them. That's their name and they registered it. So you get a name like that and well, you're okay, you're in business. Okay, so we go back. <laughs> And then, so we're sitting around the table thinking up names. How about Cougar? Cougar Sports. Cougar Sports, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Falcon. Falcon Sports. Okay, put that one. We, we need ten. Put that one on the list. <coughs> so you can tell where we're going. We, we're following down the animal, birds, that idea of fine, you know, like puma and whatever, tiger. And uh, you mentioned my dictionary. Well, my dictionary is sitting next to me on, my, on the table. But let me take you back to 1943, when I'm eight years old. Eight years old, middle of World War II, and as you say, using Foster Spikes, I won a race. I won an 80-yard race. Oh, great, fantastic. Go up to collect my prize. And uh, that's it. What do I get? I get a dictionary. And I'm saying to the guy, come on, where's the football? You know... What's the football? What could I do with the dictionary? I didn't even know at that time it was an American dictionary, Webster's. Uh, I suppose I could have kicked the dictionary around a bit, but uh, uh, so disappointed at not getting the football, the uh, the dictionary started to drop somewhere for so many years, and here we are now in 1960, and I have my dictionary there, and I like the letter R. I don't know why, mm. I just like the letter R. So I opened my Webster's Dictionary, my American Dictionary, and you probably know the American spelling is a bit different than the English spelling on a number of uh, things. Um, so I opened my Dictionary R and I start thumbing through. 
And very soon I come across R, double E, B O K, Reebok. What's that? It's a small South African gazelle. We're a running company. Gazelle. Fantastic. Top of the list. That was it. Fantastic. Yes. We had our list. I don't know all the names. I can't remember all the names now. But I went back to the agent and I said, look, I know you told me to bring 10. And here's your 10. But we want this one. We want Reebok. We've got to be in love with it. You know, we've got to feel that uh, this has got to be our name. This is something that we can, you know, really own and and work for. Um, but he's a lawyer. He didn't care. You know, he's like, okay. Right. Anyway, it took him about two weeks to go through the whole ten names, check them all out with the register. <coughs> and uh, he came back, came on the phone and said, Joe, you've got your wish. You can have Reebok. Oh, great. Fantastic. Just one caveat. Hmm, what's that? Well, the registrar in his wisdom has said that if somebody starts making shoes out of Reebok skin, you can't stop them saying that these are out of Reebok skin. Well, Jeff and I looked at each other and said, that's never going to happen. Nobody's <laughs> ever going to do that. Impossible. We'll have Reebok. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll begin again. Again. The uh, the registrar, in his wisdom, mm -hmm. said, well, because, uh, because of that, we're going to have to put you in the B section of the register. <clears throat> Up to two months ago, we didn't even know there was a register. Yes. <laughs> so what's the matter? You know, who, who's concerned with a B section or what? Right, fair enough. That's, that's good. Ten years later, the registrar came back to us and said, uh, we moved you to the A section. Oh, right, really? Fabulous. Why? He said, well, now everybody knows that Reebok is a sports shoe and the animal, unfortunately, has to come second. <laughs> so that's how we got Reebok. <laughs> and that's how we got the dictionary. <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay, so a South African antelope type of animal. Um, and I think what's so interesting in the book here also is the struggle because people... You know, people listening might be entrepreneurs or might become entrepreneurs and, and most of them probably are in the struggle. And I think, you know, there, there are several moments in the book that are just so honest and raw about this. And I think, you know, one of them is when you and your wife are living together in the factory um, and it's shaking so much. So you're like putting up equipment against the side because so the floor, floor is not going to fall through. Um, and you're working there together with your brother, Jeff. And even though your grandfather was in the business before, you didn't start off with, with, uh, with that much money. So it was really just getting by, I, I, as I understand it, especially in the beginning. Uh, can you describe yes. what that was, uh, working with your, with your brother and um, living in the factory and uh, you know, worrying that the floor is going to fall through? And, and at the same time, um, you you have left uh, your father's company. Can you describe what that life was like for you? Freedom. That was freedom. You know, all all these all these things, all these irritations, are just simply that, just irritations. Um, before we were trying to do something. Now, now we were free. We could do what we like. Okay. The, the, the building's rickety. It's, we have to put the machinery on the sides to make sure we don't fall through. And uh, the upstairs floor, we had to, that covered in, in cans and buckets and everything because the roof was shot at. The rain was just coming through all the time. So, uh, but you know, that, that, was, that was part of being, part of the job. That was part of freedom. <laughs> you know, if you want freedom, there's a price to pay. <laughs> and, uh, um, but you know, we pay for it. We're young. We 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 could do that. You know, I I would find it very difficult today to do that. <laughs> but uh, in our early twenties, uh, we were we were okay. That that was no real problem. And um, you know, our biggest problem. Eighteen months into our business, we had to change our name. And uh, you know, because. Oh, you know, we liked we 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 liked Mercury, and we had the Winged Messenger as our uh, logo. That was good. Yeah, we, we liked that. So having to change our name that was that was our first, uh, I, I suppose, our first big problem. Uh, but four years into our business, we get a letter from Adidas from their lawyers, because we had 
the silhouette of our shoe was two stripes and a T-bar. And the, uh, the Adidas lawyer said, no, 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 that, that infringes our three stripes. Oh, and Adidas, Adidas are big, like British Shoe Corporation. Yeah. They're, a big, they're a big company. Uh, so for a few minutes, Jeff and I puzzled over what, what do we do? And then we thought, just a minute. Adidas know we're here. Adidas feel it necessary to write us a letter to tell us that we're infringing the three stripes. That's great. Fabulous. Let's pin that on the wall. So we pinned it on the wall and we changed our, our silhouette. We, we changed to the vector. And uh, that, that was another lesson. But, uh, okay, so you get a problem. Uh, what do we do with that problem? Let's turn it around and make life better. Can we do something better with, you know, than what we're doing? Mm. And, and I think our name, Reebok, was better than Mercury. And our vector was much more individual than two stripes and a T, mm. uh, and a T bar. Mm. So, great. We learned at that point that when you, when you get a problem, that, that, is, that is an opportunity. And turning those problems into opportunities, that is part of... The, it's part of being in business, part of those things you've got to get uh, get over. During these interviews, I've traveled around and spent a lot of time in many different airports and airplanes. And if you traveled from any of the major Nordic airports last year, you probably know of the security lines that were three hours long and that we had a so-called mountain of luggage. And I learned the hard way because that's where my bag was buried for weeks. So that's why I'm very happy to announce SQL's partnership with American Express. And I've been an American Express Platinum member since a long time. And that's just saved me so much time and headache in traveling especially. And as a member, you can use a fast track line to skip the waiting and security at selected airports. And their travel insurance is one of the strongest on the market. So when my bag was lost, I was reimbursed for buying a set of new clothes and they help you with many other things that can go wrong when you travel. So if you also want less headaches and a better experience when traveling, you can find out more about the Platinum card in the description below or on the American Express website. But I think, you know, it's, it's very interesting because during this time, um, you, were, you were working in the factory, uh, you sold your house and moved in together with your wife's family and you took side jobs just to kind of stay above surface, stay above the, the water level. Did this feel like a sacrifice for you at the time or now, you know, the, it's, a, it's a big part of the entrepreneurial journey, I think, to make these sacrifices that people don't really uh, talk about that much. But how I, did that feel for you? And uh, I think my wife probably found more of a sacrifice than I did because we, we were so excited. You know, the, the, the idea of this freedom, this you can go that way, you can go that way, you can do what you like. Okay, you don't have the money to do what you'd like, but you know you, you you can push, you can move in in whatever direction. So for me, it probably wasn't such a big problem, uh, probably for my wife. But then again, she was young also, and uh, when when you're young, it's surprising how you can bounce over things and get and get on with life. But you know what you're talking about really is uh, is optimism. You've got to be an optimist. And uh, to an extent, my wife was a pessimist. She was always doubting and questioning. She, a number of times she said, why don't you go out and get a decent job? You know, <laughs> okay. But I was forever the optimist. You know, the glass is half full, not half empty. And it's, it was forever that, no, we can do it. Even, you know, yeah. So, and, and I think you have to have that. To, to get through some of the times, you know, when... Uh, when you've no money to pay the wages. I, I, I remember we had no money, but I had a friend I was making boots for, and I used to have to drive over to 10, 12 miles and go and collect a check off him for some boots that we'd made recently and take it into the bank before the bank would let me have money for the wages. Mm -hmm. So, but again, you know, and people say, why are you doing that? Why, you know, why do you need that? And... It, it wasn't a burden. I, I felt it was a price that we paid for being for being able to do what we wanted to do, for being able to get out there and you know, 
we could do this. You know, so, yeah, it's not going to be roses and wonderful and great all the time. You've got to expect it's going to be a bit tough. And, uh, you know, we both Jeff and I have been in the scouting organisation while we were growing up, and you do learn a lot about looking after yourself during that. You know, the, uh, we had a very good uh, scout master, and he used to put us through some stupid things. So we were somewhat used to, uh, OK, let's do it differently. Let's get out there. Let's, we, can, we, can, we can get on with it, and we can do it. So what were these jobs that you had during the time these side jobs to be able to financially support yourself. We started to do something which we had sort of said to my father, look, we need to, we need to get out there and sell our product. Get out there and sell the shoes, you know, we, we need to do that. But of course, my, the, the, the Reebok brand wasn't big enough to earn a living. So I had to take on other brands. So I had three or four other, other people's uh, products, whether they were games, they were darts, we used to, I used to sell uh, darts. So I, I used to take those out and go and sell those as well to, to make a living. But uh, it, it was really finding out how, how we could best sell our shoes. Because I, whilst I went out and I went to these retailers, uh, the sports shop, and I'd go to the sports shop and go in and the guy there, the buyer, or the, the guy who owned the shop, he would say, uh, I'd say, uh, I'm Reebok. And he'd say to me, who's Reebok? Well, I'm Reebok. And I'd show him the product. Oh, right, yeah, that's a nice product, that nice. He'd say, then he'd look at his shelf and he'd say, I've got Adidas and I've got Dunlop. Why do I need Reebok? Well, that was a very interesting question for me because he didn't need Reebok. Oh, yeah, why do you need Reebok? So, uh, and I, I'd pondered over this quite some time, but then I mentioned the three years before the Amateur Athletic Association. Well, they, they produced a handbook. And in that handbook was the name and address of every secretary of every club in the country. And there were 400 clubs. Hmm. It didn't take me long to work out if I wrote them a letter and offered them a discount and... Uh, and said, okay, if we can, uh, you know, if there's somebody in the club wants to become an agent, they can have 15% and become the agent. And right, sent the letter out. And I, from that first letter, I got over 100 agents. So that was it. All of a sudden, our business changed for direct selling. We were direct selling to the clubs. Mm. And, uh, and it was growing. We were growing. I think in, in the end, I, I ended up with about 250 to 300 agents throughout the three A's. Um, and then I, we were also specialising. You know, we were in the north of England. And uh, we we knew we had to look for space. We called it white space. The space where nobody else is. And in the north of England, we had cross-country running. We had fell running. We had orienteering. Um they did things in the north of England they didn't do in other parts of the country and maybe Europe. So we were able to make specialised products. And we had Rugby League. Rugby League as against Rugby Union. Uh, rugby League was a slightly different game. So we concentrated on that white space. <coughs> and it was that that allowed us to grow and grow and grow a bit bigger. But what, what was annoying me most was the fact that uh, OK, Adidas now owned football. And for us to get into football, we just didn't have the money. Hmm. We just couldn't do that. So I'm looking around and thinking, I, I, need, I need to get into a bigger market. And that's when I'm looking to America. Because, uh, funnily enough, Foster's had been dealing with America, and they have been selling... 200 pairs of hand-sewn running shoes to Yale University every month. And Yale University used to sell them on across the country. So I knew that was big. I knew that uh, every university and every college had a coach. And coach was a god in America. They were the god. Also, you could go to a university on a scholarship, on a sports scholarship. So... You know, we're talking 350 million Americans as against, uh, in those days, about 50 million Brits. Um, OK, we were dealing in Europe, and people say, why, why, why are you thinking of America? Why not go to Europe? 
I say, Mum, in Europe we've got 30 different countries and 30 different languages, and 20 different cultures. This is, that's hard work. Yeah, that really is hard work. Why, why do I need that when the Americans more or less speak English? <laughs> more or less. <laughs> and, uh, you know, listen. And it's, and it's a big market. It's a big, big market. Uh, but the family, the family are saying, "No, Joe, what's going to cost us an arm and a leg for you to go to America? You can't go to America. That's, that's, uh, breaking into that market is going to be too costly." It so happened. I am reading a magazine, a magazine called Eurosport, and there's an advertisement in Eurosport put there by the British government and the British government wants us to export and they they want us to uh, export particularly to America and uh, and in this they were saying that uh, we'll pay for you a stand at the NSGA the National Sporting Goods Association of America in Chicago we'll pay for a stand we'll also pay for your return airfare and uh, and we'll pay half of your hotel expense all of a sudden, I got no complaints from the family. Yeah, Joe, you can go. You go. Okay. That's fine. Uh, so, I'm going off to America in 1968 with my bag and my shoes and yeah, turning up at Chicago. And if you've ever been in Chicago in February, you know it's very cold. It's freezing. Very cold. Oh. <laughs> cold freezing, yeah. Yeah, the coldest I've ever been. Anyway, I went across there. And uh, I went with a friend. In fact, the friend I said that we were making some climbing boots for, and uh, he was in Manchester, local. So he went with me. We both went. Um, he managed to sell some of his boots to the outdoor trade. I didn't manage to sell any of my shoes at all. But since, since we were making the boots for him, you know, we did get some business. But... The guys, the guys coming up and saying, oh, love your product. Yeah, where, do, where, where can we get this from? And I'm saying, from England. And uh, England. And they're, they're saying to me, is that New England? No, 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 New England. Across the water, you know, England. Oh, they're saying, that's London. Yeah, 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 it's London. Yeah. Oh, right. They didn't want to know. They, it was too difficult to do the uh, go through the task of ordering the product and mm. importing it, paying the duty. So I knew, I knew that I had to get distribution in America. I had to get somebody. Mm. And uh, this is 1968. So how many years into the business are you now? In 68. 1968 was that's 10 years in the business. 10 years in. Yeah. Maybe 10 years into the business. Yeah. And uh, we were growing steadily. We were, we were, we were making our way. But uh, by the time I got to America, it was 1979. took me 11 years of trying to get onto the market, to trying to get distribution. I had six failures, six attempts. And with one guy, I was with him for four years. And we still couldn't penetrate the market. Um, but of course... You've, you've, you've got to run with your luck. And uh, we were having some luck at this point because during the 1970s, running, running became a big category in America. Mm. Everybody's going out running. We've got 350 million Americans and a lot of those, 10% at least, were going out running. 35 million, oh, after going out running, yeah. Big market. And of course, Nike, Nike were growing on this market. It was their home market. And this was brilliant for Nike, that's let them grow. But the big influence was Runner's World. Runner's World was a magazine. And the magazine, it was just a running magazine. Not only could you see what shoes you could buy, um, they, they also, they sort of listed all the races that you could go to. So you could travel and you'd go, and go into a race. And they also put the results of the race so that people could see their name in there in, the, in this magazine. Great. And uh, and it was growing like mad, really growing, growing fast. And by, I think about 1976, Bob Anderson, who produced the magazine, decided he could tell everybody which was the best pair of shoes to buy, 
which was the number one run issue. Okay, it wasn't Reebok. It was Nike, of course. Well, that's great because if you all of a sudden you got, you got 35 million Americans running, 10% of those probably wanted that shoe. So three and a half million Americans wanted that shoe. All of a sudden, we want that shoe. <sighs> Nike. Phil Knight. Problem for Phil Knight? He was making those shoes in Asia. <laughs> so so he just he just couldn't get the quantity and he had a problem. Great. So it took them almost twelve months to start this sort of momentum going with the product. But Bob Anderson in his wisdom said, Okay, Nike's been top shoe for twelve months. There must be, you know, we'll test other shoes. And he came up with another number one. It wasn't Nike this time. Maybe New Balance, maybe been Brooks, it may have been a tonic. I, I, I don't remember. Again, it wasn't Reebok. Same problem. Everybody wanted the new product. Couldn't get it. 12 months go by. Bob Anderson changes his idea and says, no, I'm not going to put a number one out there. I'm going to change this to uh, star ratings. So anybody with a five-star shoe, those were all number ones. Well, you could get probably four or five, which would make a five-star shoe. And that was the time... When I knew we could make a five-star shoe. How did you know that? <clears throat> well, you know, it's, it's like there, there are probably some things you know you can do hmm. because you've got the experience. You've been there. You, you know where to go. You know, this is your trade. You, you know how to get people on to, uh, uh, to, to talk to. You know? hmm. There are certain things you know. Hmm. We were in that business. We were not just a a shoemaking factory that happened to make a few sports shoes. We were 100% sports shoes. Mm. We were 100% running. We're re <clears throat> we knew what was needed. We knew where to get it, how to get the materials, how to put this together. Possibly a little overconfident, but this was our shot. And by February of 1979, I had my shoe Aztec. We had had... We'd had it tested out pretty well, and we'd actually had Aztec, Midas, and Inca, three of our shoes were called part of the gold range. We had them, uh, we had them in the, uh, I think it was the, it was the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton, and, uh, and that was in 1978, and we won a lot of medals with our shoes. So we're pretty confident we've got the right lot of shoes here. So February 1979. The shoe edition doesn't come out until August. So we have a bit of time there. And uh, by that time, running was so big in America. Everybody wanted to get in on it. And fortunately, we were still being, uh, hmm. still being supported by the government. The government was still paying for me to go over <laughs> there. Great. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know Kmart. Kmart yep. are a big... Uh, wholesale distrib distributor in America, a big uh, distributor. Yep. And Kmart came along and uh, they liked our product and said, look, uh, we'd like to place uh, 20,000 pairs, an order for 20,000 pairs for your, your Aztec. This was the one we were pretty sure would be a five-star. 20,000, 25,000 pairs. And, uh, wow, that's about six months' work for our small factory still in India. <laughs> and, right. Okay, but, uh, <clears throat> and, and he said, uh, well, in fact, I had a friend in the UK, I don't know if you've heard of Barter. Barter mm -hmm. are still the biggest shoemaking company in the world, mm -hmm. but they're not that well known in Europe these days. Mm -hmm. They're more known in Latin America and India. That's where okay. they get the volumes, still get their volumes from. But uh, Barter had a factory in England, and I knew the guy was, uh, he was just setting up their sports division. And he said, Joey, he said, look, if you, uh, if you get some good orders, you get a five-star shoe, we'll help you. Okay, so the volume part of it, that was good. That, that, well, that would help me, yeah, volume. But then the guy from Kmart said, but Mr. Foster, we need a better price. And I knew what he meant when he wanted a better price. He meant you're going to have to go to, the, to Asia to get them out okay. of the Far East because that's, you're not going to be able to make them in Europe. And you were still making them in the UK at this time? We were still making them in the UK, yeah. But again, I knew very well if we were looking for volume and we had to start looking at price. So I had made contact with the agent of uh, a South Korean company 
one of the largest companies in South Korea making uh, footwear. And they were already producing samples for me. So I knew, I thought, well, yeah, we're going to be able to do that as well. So we're going to get the price, we're going to get the volume, we could do it. Okay, so that is towards the end of the show, there's uh, uh, an American guy came up to me, Paul Feynman. And uh, Paul Feynman, he, he was also exhibiting at the show. But he was exhibiting in the uh, the outdoor side of uh, b- the business, and he he ran a company called Boston Boston Camping. And uh, Paul said, uh, "Yeah, if you get a five star shoe," he said, "I'd love to be your distributor." And I said, "Paul, Paul, come and have a look at our Aztec. Come and have a look." Showed him the Aztec. And Paul said, okay, Joe, yeah, I love your shoe. He said, but it's not a five-star shoe yet, is it? No, no it's not a five-star shoe yet, but, you know, but we're pretty sure we're going to get there. So he said, if you manage that, I'm your man. So we're talking February, and between February and August, there's a bit of time, so uh, I'd gone home, and then I went back to America and went back to see uh, Kmart. Uh, and I was a bit sort of, yeah. They sort of took me to the room where all the salesmen were. And there's about 100 salesmen all at different desks. And they point to the one that had seen me in uh, in Chicago. And yes, he was willing to place the order. You know, we're ready to go ahead sort of thing. Give him, a, give him the right price. And I thought, you know, this might be my first 25000 per order. But it might also be my last. Because we'd, we... Their business is driven by square footage and how much profit they can mm. make out of their square footage. So, okay, I was happy with that. And then I, I went over to Boston to meet up with Paul Feynman. And I liked Paul Feynman. We could get on together. We could talk. You know, good, yes. Great. And he had this nice small outfit there. They got about uh, 10 or 12 people working for them. They had a nice, nice sales operation. I think this would, this would work better for me. I'm sure this would work better for me. Anyway... We go back, and uh, last week in July, this is this is when the August edition of Runners World comes out with the uh, um, with what we hope we get a five star shoe. Mm. <coughs> so uh, I phoned Paul Feynman, uh, and I said, "Paul, <coughs> can you can you go down to the local kiosk see if Runners World's out? Because if it is, you know, probably have a five star shoe there." An hour later. Paul came back. Joe, Aztec, five stars. You got it. We're in business. He said, not only that, Inca and Midas also got five stars in their own category. So that was it. We brought them into America with three five-star shoes. And that was the beginning of our trip into America. Wow. <laughs> it's, such an, it's such an incredible story. And I, I think what's, what's sometimes easy to forget is the duration of over these years from getting started and just surviving in the business and dealing with the rejection over such a long time to eventually go on head to head with both Adidas and Nike with, as you mentioned, founded by Phil Knight, who wrote shoe dog, um, how did you deal with these, you know, rejections? <laughs> and you said you had six failed attempts to go into the U.S., but also not only in the U.S., but you had all these kind of rejections in the normal s- side of the business. H- how did you deal with that over such an extended period of time? It's not only weeks, months, or years. This is decades. I guess you come back to optimism, and, and I guess you come back to knowing full well that it wasn't the product wasn't the product there's nothing wrong with the product we could get there the product was great we know we got all that covered it was just a matter of getting the right people and this is what took the time getting the people get, being able to get in in there and find those right people and whilst i thought i'd found at least six right people they turned out not to be the right people and it was only when i got to paul Feynman. but you know we we, we still had the a big problem because Paul Feynman didn't have any money. 
And I didn't have any money, not, not the sort of money that you need when mm. you've got a five-star shoe and all of a sudden your demand there is for a million pairs of shoes. I, I think Paul's first order was 20,000 pairs and he was needing to order 20,000 pairs a month. <coughs> and we were not supplying them. It was either going to be Barter, who would supply them, or we'd go to the Far East. Um, <clears throat> Barter did supply the first 20,000 pairs, and they gave him a credit line, which is good. Because normally when you're dealing overseas, you need to have a letter of credit, which means that the bank have to issue a letter of credit to say that these people will pay the bill. Hmm. And, of course, uh, we, we never had that sort of money. So to get a letter of credit would be difficult. We needed a credit line. And uh, Barter gave uh, Paul Feynman a credit line. <sighs> the problem is that they got the product wrong. Barter were shoemakers. They were not sports shoemakers. So they mm. looked at our shoe and they said, no, we can make this different this way. This, this way we can, it's quicker if we cut out these things. Make them. So they, they made some changes. They were also a very large company, and they made their own rubber. And uh, it was during this time that EVA, an expanded vinyl acetate, which is a, a plastic sponge, very light in weight, and that was fairly new to the market. And Barter decided they could make it themselves. Unfortunately, 90% was great, 10% was undercured. And when it's undercured, it means it doesn't bounce back, it just collapses. So a lot of the shoes that they made collapsed, apart from the fact that they changed the look of the design. Changing the look of the design didn't matter too much. We could, we could get that back again to where it should be. But uh, when 10% of your product is collapsing, that is a problem. So to <clears throat> Paul Feynman never paid for the shoes. <laughs> it, you know, you're trying to ruin our business. <laughs> you know, these, these shoes are bad. And during that period of time, it gave us time to get the Korean business working. But even then, we needed, because the Koreans needed a letter of credit, so we needed to find somebody to, uh, to back us through that, and we did. We found Stephen Rubin, who, uh, who right now you might know as JD Sports. JD Sports are one mm. of the biggest sports yeah. in Europe, mm. biggest retailers in Europe. They in in Europe and uh, Australia, America. They're big, really big now. And uh, Stephen Stephen gave us a credit line because one of his companies um, was a sourcing company out of Korea. So he said, okay, that sourcing company they they'll, they'll give you a letter, a, a credit line. And we use that credit line pretty big. <laughs> use that credit line, but you know, <coughs> running running wasn't the main reason that we broke into America. That was aerobics. Yeah, can you tell me about that? I I, I want to get into the the aerobics side of things, and also, if I remember correctly, Reebok was the first made the first sneaker that was designed and marketed towards women as well. Exactly. And this was aerobics. We had a, we had a guy, during the running, we were growing nicely, and we had a, um, a technical rep, a tech rep down in Los Angeles, Arnold Martinez. And uh, Arnold's wife, Frankie, she was going to uh, these aerobic classes. And she was going with her friends who were coming back, and Arnold said to uh, Frankie, Frankie, what are you doing? Right? What's happened? said, oh, we're doing aerobics. And, of course, nobody knew what that meant in those days. And uh, Arnold said, what's aerobics? She said, well, we're actually exercising to music. And we love it. It's fantastic. Next class, Arnold went down there and had a look at this and what they were doing. And there was the instructor. The instructor was wearing a pair of sneakers. We think they were New Balance. Half the class were wearing the same sneaker. The other half of the class, no shoes. Oh, for Arnold, that was, wow, why don't we make a shoe specifically for aerobics for women and women's sizes on a woman's last and make them out of garment leather, not garment, out of glove leather. Fantastic. He got the next flight he could do to get up to uh, Boston to go and see Paul Feynman and said, Paul, Paul, we've got this fantastic uh, 
thing, sport going on down in down in Los Angeles. And uh, Paul said, I know, slow down. Slow down. Why do we want to be making shoes for girls dancing? We're a running company and we're doing very nicely. So Arnold wasn't happy with uh, the fact that Paul wanted him to slow down. And he went around to the back door to see Steve Liggett. Steve Liggett was our product man. And he did a much better job on Steve Liggett. And he got Steve to get him 200 pairs of samples. Just what he wanted. When they arrived, Arnold took them down there, gave them to the instructors and some of the leading girls who were doing the aerobics. Great. They loved the shoes. They, they wore the shoes all day. The trouble is, they were made out of glove leather. And glove leather, if you can imagine, it's 0.7 of a millimetre thick. You could tear it like a piece of paper. So all the shoes were falling apart. They were breaking out at the, uh, at the welt where the sole meets the upper. Fortunately, we were in Los Angeles, America, and the girls loved them so much they just went out and bought a new pair. Of course, it caused a little bit of a problem that, but we, we got over it eventually, and eventually we got down to garment leather, which was much stronger. And then when uh, Jane Fonda went out and actually bought a pair of Reebok to use in her exercise videos, that was it. We just exploded. We were a $9 million company at that time. And this was 20 years in, into the business, and then what happened? And then what happened? One year, one year into aerobics, we were a $30 million company. A year later, we were a $90 million company. And a year after that, a $300 million company. And then a year after that, just over a year, we were a $900 million company. <laughs> that is so, crazy. I mean, that, that was incredible. From almost zero to one billion in under five years. And how do you, how do you keep up? I mean, in the business, just operationally, that's a massive headache going from nine to 30. I can't even imagine going to nine to 900 in, what did you say, four or five years? Just operationally. Well, operationally, of course, we were a successful company, so people joined our company, wanted to join our company. So we got a lot of good people. The biggest problem, the biggest problem was product. It's how do you go from $300 million worth of product to $900 million worth of product in just over one year? It's, well, it's that a was the crazy biggest problem. Number. But that was when, yeah, when Nike, Nike had been doing fantastic business and been growing, growing almost as fast as Reebok grew in them. But they'd been growing before us. But then they hit a wall. All of a sudden, they found themselves overproduced, too much stock, and they had to pull out of, I think it was three large factories in Korea, just when we needed them. Because getting the product, you can't just suddenly say, we, I want more product. Factories have a limited size and a limited mm. ability to grow. So the fact that Nike had to come out of those factories and the Reebok were able to go in, that's what allowed us to grow. Otherwise, we'd have lost that business. What Was this the time when Reebok took the number one market share in the US in the 80s? Yes. Yeah. Shortly after that, we we overtook Adidas, and we overtook Nike and became number one. I have to ask you, what was your life like at this time? Were you still living in the UK or had you moved over to the US? And did you have time for family? And just for, um, from a personal view during these, you know, incredible years of growth and, and all the business, what, what was it like for you personally in your lifestyle? I, I, I never saw the necess necessity or, or the need for me to become, to, to go to America because the Americans are good at their own market. For me to go in the, no. So, I stayed in the UK and, and I I then turned my attention, having put Paul Feynman on in America, it was necessary then to go around the globe and build a global distribution. So that became my job. <coughs> and I was uh, I, I was going around the around the world continuously. And I, I went around the world at least three times every year, just going meeting new people, putting on new distributors and then making sure they did the right thing. So and I was continually on the move. And I, and I think at that time, we were, being, we were successful. 
at that time the family were happy that we were successful um, okay uh, I wanted my family to travel with me because at that point you could at least my wife could have traveled with me but uh, no she, she didn't like to she didn't want to uh, except on one occasion and if you read the book you will realize it I did get some difficulty at, uh, into difficulty at that time but uh, I mean life was so full of uh, things to do it was continuous and I was also hosting a pro celebrity tennis um, tournament that we had in Monte Carlo, where we met all the stars. We brought stars from um, Hollywood. A lot of the stars came over and became part of that. So it, it was a very exciting time. But uh, somehow it got to the point where the challenge wasn't there anymore. I, you know, this wasn't a challenge. This we we'd grown. We got to an incredible side and become number one. And so in 1989, I decided to step back and, uh, and and take it easy. Because, you know, we we had so many accountants, so many lawyers, and so many people in between, and the distribution was really going. So it was time for me to sort of step back and take some time off. Was that something that you'd been uh, thinking about? Because it must have been such a demanding time on kind of like the the balance in life with all this traveling over all these years and and the growth over in the US and and also worldwide so did that make you think over a longer time before you stepped back in in 89 yeah and i, I think i'd been used to uh, handling the business and the problems and i got the excitement out of uh, really the challenges but now, now there was no challenge, though. It was just a matter of uh, going to the airport, being picked up by a limousine, going to the best hotels and uh, dining at the best uh, restaurant. And, uh, and I'm thinking, well, no, I'm, I'm missing something. And the thing I was missing was the challenge. Uh, this, this wasn't my challenge anymore. Everything was done by lawyers and accountants. And uh, I... I, w I was just really being a, an ambassador. And, you know, I'm thinking, <coughs> no, I, I, need, I need to change. And Were so you looking for a new challenge was, uh, at this time? Probably not at that time. I, I, was, I was thinking, I'd rather not sort of turn around and say, somebody say to me, here's your next ticket, Joe. Here's your next ticket. Because... Flying around so much, it was all a matter of uh, where's the next ticket, and, and mm. probably one of the uh, one of the most difficult things was is deciding. No, I don't want to do that anymore, yeah. and then you you're sort of doing nothing or you're doing much less for a month, and you're thinking, where's the where, where's the next ticket? I'm used to having a, I'm used to being at somewhere else. I, you know, where's my next ticket? So it was almost like giving up uh, smoking or giving up drink. I'd given up flying. <laughs> yeah. And it was, uh, <laughs> what, that, that, that was quite difficult at the time. It must have been. What, what did you do, like, right after you decided to step down? Um, did, that, did that mean you, you left with, uh, I, I guess you had a lot of financial freedom already before this, but after this time, I guess you would never have to work again, of course, in your life. Uh, but what what did you do with your time that, you know, all the time that freed up after this? Reebok had grown so fast and, uh, and, had, uh, <clears throat> and had moved into different various areas <clears throat> that uh, it wasn't long before the phone rang again. Joe, what did we do with this? And there were a lot of questions started coming in. What, what happened here? What happened? Oh, so really, I never left. Reebok. Mm. It was always a matter of slowing down, but uh, they wanted me at so many different places, you know, because I'd, I'd put together the whole of the uh, international uh, sales group, and so somebody else had to start taking that over. So there was a lot of calls, a lot of things that went on for many, many years. And in fact, there was one point when uh, we decided decided I, I would look after the bags and start doing, going back to some of these countries just to do something. And so we did that for a while. But uh, eventually I was able to settle down and relax a bit more until until we got computers. 
We got computers, we got smartphones. We didn't have any of that when we, when, when I was running the business and uh, doing what I was doing. It all had to be done by, if you were lucky, you could get a phone call through. Otherwise, you had to fly somewhere. You had to make arrangements and fly and go and meet people. Mm-hmm. Now we've got computers and we have Wikipedia and we have Google and they start telling me how Reebok began. They started telling me what we did. And there was even a photograph of Joe Foster, founder of Reebok. It might have been Joe Foster, but it certainly wasn't me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the story. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And the stories they put out about how Reebok began were so wrong. And I'm thinking, no. We've got to get this right. So that's what inspired me, gave me the new challenge, write a book. So that's where Shoemaker started. And um, Do you feel that things have been cleared up since the publishing of the book? Well, I did think to a certain extent, but we still read. um, In fact, I think it's not. We we have peered into, uh, it's it's a Latin American airline. We're now in the uh, the online book. They've got a book, in the, and there's a story about how things began. And somebody sent me that. And again, it's like, why don't you read the book? Why don't you read the book and get it right? <laughs> they, they get different interpretations. Uh, so now the challenge is to get everybody to read the book, so, so that we don't get that, a continual amount of uh, variations. I, I... But. I don't know. I guess a lot of these people say, someone says, oh, Joe Foster's been to Panama. Um, we, we need you to write a little article about uh, Joe Foster and Reebok. So, and they do a certain amount of research. But I think some of these people research old articles. Mm, <laughs> and so they just yeah. repeated some of the old articles yeah. instead, of, <laughs> instead of getting old, old of the book and reading the book. And, but the book is taking us all over the place now. It's, uh, it really is. I say it's taking us to Australia in two days' time. We we'll leave for Australia, and we're what. What has also changed is that Reebok now have been bought by ABG, mm. Authentic Brands Group, mm. in America, and uh, uh, and they've they've signed a lot of license deals around around the globe. Yeah, globally they now. I think I think they're now going to be in about thirty five thousand different outlets because of mm. ABG, whereas. With uh, with Adidas, Adidas bought the group, bought bought uh, Reebok, and uh, in two thousand and five, Adidas really two thousand five, yeah. But Reebok and Adidas really occupy the same space, and so Adidas really didn't do Reebok any good. They they were a bit sort of uh, went down for quite some time. Uh, they didn't give them the exposure. But now, the exposure they're going to get with ABG is going to be incredible. And mm-hmm. ABG expect in, uh, I think, in well, probably the end of uh, next year to be at least a $5 billion company at retail. Oh, wow. Um, and by 1930, a $10 billion company. Because Reebok, whilst Reebok just achieved slightly under $4 billion when it was sold, it... With with Adidas, it went down to about one and a half billion in sales. So now the growth is going to be incredible. What was it uh, when you in eighty nine ninety when uh, when you stepped off? At, at what uh, at what size in revenue do you remember? I think at that time we we're about three and a half billion. So we we'd grown because during the nineties it became during the nineties it became static, we just went over four billion during the nineties and then leveled off uh before being bought by Adidas for three point six billion, I think it was Adidas paid for it. But uh they seemed to lose the way midway through the nineties. At what point did you realise that people back in back home in the UK during these years of growth and the entering into the US. When did you realize that people started, you know, taking Reebok seriously and seeing this as a really big company that came up? Was that, you know, when you started out in the US or did that take a long time before you started, you know, being, uh, getting some confirmation for this? Yeah, I think when everybody started to realize that Reebok, big company, was when, when aerobics really took off. 
Because mm. aerobics, that's when, when we got the growth. <coughs> and, you know, it's a funny thing, that, because the growth was so big that uh, I, I remember being in America and people are talking about, you know, what, well, I called in on such and such a person, and they said, well, you're a big company now. Well, we only think we're a small company. Yeah. <laughs> so we were thinking ourselves a small company for a long while until people were telling us we're a big company. And then we were sort of a decision saying, look, guys, why do we think we're a small company? Everybody thinks we're a big company. Why don't we think we're a big company? <laughs> so and then your attitude changes. Yeah, well, we are pretty big. And, of course, when we became number one, that, yeah, that really was it. We, we were a big company. Now, do you feel maybe you don't see them as sacrifices, but there's always been a struggle, and I think it's a, it's a very um, honest and open way of describing this in the book. Do you think the, the struggle and the, the sacrifices has been worth it? I think it's probably a way of how you can value what you did. You can value the result by, having, by acknowledging those struggles. And, and understand understanding them, because um, people do ask me, like you know, one of the most important things of growing your company, and and I say to them, well, number one, it's having fun. You've got to have fun, otherwise you won't make it. And number two, it's having more fun, because it's tough out there. So you've got to have fun. And number three, you've got to make every bit of opportunity you can to have fun. And and I think that's what keeps you going is that no, we we're, we're going to have as much fun as we can with this. Even though you know, a lot of days are not fun. I mean, I lost my brother, Jeff, just when we uh, just when we'd achieved America. We just got into America. Just got a five star shoe in America, and and unfortunately he died of cancer. And and that you know it's those sort of things that they're not fun, but mm. it probably probably makes you redouble your effort to make it happen. And, you know, you, so you, you get charged up with it. And that's, that in itself is exciting. You know, that in itself is, when you see some of the results, it's, you know, it's, it's great to see. So yeah, you, know, you can never, because people do say, what would you change if you could? Uh, and I, you know, my response to that is, look, we became number one. What is there to change? <laughs> the only thing I would change is the fact that uh, that Jeff died, and I can't do mm. that. Mm. You know, I can't do those things. But otherwise, yeah, yeah, you could change lots of things. Uh, but well, you achieved number one, so what's the point? Mm. And uh, no, it's, it's been great. Yeah, and and I think now that uh, chasing around with uh, with shoemaker is now quite it's quite good fun. And I wanted to ask also, in your book, you you make two kind of confessions. And one of them is that you're not a runner. And the other one is that you're actually a pretty lousy shoemaker. What, what, <laughs> what is going on there? <laughs> I used to be a fairly good runner, but uh, I didn't like it. My father wanted me to run and enter. And uh, I, I was only young and I got to the point where I said, I don't want to do this. It, you know, I, I don't get anything out of that. I, I don't want to do it. So I think my father gave up on me at that point that, that I didn't want to do what he wanted me to do. And the other one, shoemaking. Jeff, my brother, he loved, he loved the factory. He absolutely loved it. I didn't. But we came to a very good arrangement, which was, he said, look, Joe, I'll look after the factory. You do everything else. <laughs> and that was it. So... I probably did some really stupid things, you know, you know maybe maybe it stopped us growing quicker, but uh, he never complained. He just looked after the factory. And uh, so we, we always got on. We never, we never had a bad word with each other. We just got on. He looked after the factory. And uh, I suppose if we hadn't have achieved some orders, maybe if we'd have lost everything, maybe then we might have fallen out. But no, it was... Uh, it was a good way for us to operate together. And I wanted to ask you, when it comes to both entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs or people who feel that they are really struggling, um, what do you have to say to them? Are the, 
in terms of getting by because i i think you are a great example of of kind of you know being able to stay and being focused for such a long period of time what do you have to say to these people that kind of are struggling with this if you believe in what you're doing um and to be an entrepreneur you have to be an optimist so an optimist can always see his way around see his way through um I think there's more opportunity today to make money quicker, to get a result quicker, because uh, social media is such in, in these days. Plus also, um, you've got venture capital. Venture capital that can get you into a position to uh, to win. We didn't. We, we had banks. And unless you've got collateral, banks don't want to know you. <laughs> so, you know, but now there are a lot more people out there. Money is much easier. In fact, we're finding on... Now we're going around. A lot of people with money mm. are, are asking us, do we know of companies that we should back? So there's a lot of money chasing good companies right now, uh, whereas there are a lot of good companies chasing money in my day. Mm. And we couldn't... Uh, we, that's why it took such a long time. I'm pretty sure it took time because we we were not in a position where we could pick up money. Um, it would have been nice to have been uh, in America, like Phil Knight, that was a, a much bigger market, and that was the market that we made it on eventually. And, and became uh, number one. Yeah, people, people talk to me. We became number one. We did indeed, yeah. Because people do talk to me, where, where should we go if we went global? And I always say, go to America. Just hmm. go to America and look at it. Look it over. That's a big market. Hmm. And uh, go check it out. Because that, you know, if you want a big market, just go check out America. And so you, you never took in external financing other than loans from banks during the company? Yeah. yeah. And um, it, it wasn't there. Yeah. And um, when, when you got started, I think it, it, it could be easy to believe that you had this kind of head start um, and, and the financing because of your grandfather's shoe business. But as, as far as I understand... When you and Jeff got started, you basically started from scratch as opposed to, you know, it could have been that you built upon your grandfather's business, but this was from scratch and you, you barely had any money when you got started in that. Is, is that correctly understood? That is correct. Really, the, the biggest mistake with, the, with my grandfather's business, J.W. Foster and Sons, was that his sons did not do what they should have done. They should have looked, where do we take this business? How can we improve this business? Uh, because by the time Jeff and I got there, the business had lost the opportunities. They should have grown bigger and they should have expanded. They should have done a lot of things that they never did. So unfortunately, in my grandfather's time, his type of business was incredible. What, what he had was incredible, but it wasn't a large business. A large opportunity for sport was when sport went street. And when sport went street, that was the start. And Adidas and Puma were there at that beginning. And now sport is fashion. Mm. You know, everybody has a pair of trainers now. And so mm. many people, you look around wherever you are, and they're wearing trainers, wearing trainers with suits. And so now, now we're big fashion. It's, you know, now, now sport is fashion. So you know, it's observing where that should be. And... Uh, we, we look at when I used to call on small retailers to try and sell my product. Those retailers don't exist anymore. Now we, uh, we have large retailers, retailers with 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 stores. Uh, and those are sports retailers. Uh, in my, my early days, there was probably three or four sports shops in every town, all run by a, a local athlete a local footballer, he, he set up his little sport. Now, they've all gone, and there's nobody in town anymore. They're all mm. in the malls. They're all mm. in the, uh, the shopping centres. Mm. So all this has changed, and I think you have to take that into consideration now. Where is the business, yeah, and how do we get... If you, if you want to start up a new brand, how do you get that brand onto the market? Mm -hmm. because there are no small retailers who will just take it and go with it. So it's different challenges. 
Joe, I want to I wanna say thank you so much. Uh, I think we have gone through not almost not even 10, 15% of, of all the interesting stories uh, from the book. Um, but uh, it's certainly a treasure and you are a treasure and I can highly recommend to anybody reading uh, Shoemaker. Um, when I'm 87 years okay. old, I want to be like you. I want to look like you. I want to have the amazing family that you have and helping as many people as you are. So I want to thank you so much for the time today. Um, it's been a pleasure and I've been, I've been very uh, honored to have this yes. conversation. Well, it's been a pleasure for me as well. And uh, good luck with your podcasting because it's, uh, it, it, it's really something very, very interesting. If anybody wants to follow us, they can do on, on Instagram. Re Reebok, the, Reebok founder. the founder on Instagram. Follow, follow the founder. Yes, yep. definitely. I will link that. And uh, nice talking to you. All the best. Thank All you the very best. much. Thank you so much, Joe.